Great. Well, let's begin. So this one is the third and fourth chapter. I think what I might do is just literally do very quick introductions of both, and then we can have the rest of the time for discussion in that way. And um, we can maybe try and keep it e evenly balanced, but people can go with whatever they want. Um, so uh, chapters three and four, I mean, I think what we see in that, they're reasonably well connected insofar as they seem to be the last little bits of conceptual exploration and elaboration that he needs to do before he's got the whole deconstructive framework set up um, in my mind. So chapter three continues with the development of Nietzsche. It's the mad truth, the just name of friendship. And here we see the naming come back again, in again exactly around the just name. The whole argument as I understand it seems to be a way of bringing forward this conception of friendship as non-proximity in lots of different ways. So I've broken it down, like George's as well, roughly into four sections to sort of summarize it. So the first section begins again with human all to human. And we once again have the wise man and the fool. We once again have the wise man linked to death and, the li and life to the fool. And friendship once again linked to the fool and the enemy linked to the wise man. Um, what Derrida seems to focus on, and uh, perhaps someone could pick this up who knows more about me, is this focus on silence which I think is one of the ways he's thinking about non-proximity in terms of friendship. And he points out that Nietzsche uses a Latin term for that. Um, it's presented as a particular type of silence. That silence has a conception or a connection to waiting as well, but also to the secret. Um, I think that's around page 54. Um, and that conception of the secret is something that's between two friends. It might be a, a more intuitive way of thinking about um, friendship. Connected to that, and we've already seen it briefly, in the second chapter was this conception of two different types of communities, one associated with the wise man, one associated with the fool, that one of shared rejoicing, of mitfreude, and one of compassion, mit light. Um, I think there's a small, t it's compassion in the French, I think, but um, I think it's, it's slightly different with suffering or something in the, in the English. Um, and so both are sort of different types of disjuncture that come with the silence, but there's a particular privileging of the shared rejoicing moment. And the second part then, is when we move to the epilogue of um, the amongst friends section, um, which is followed almost immediately by a parenthesis about Heidegger, um, and which focuses on the potential of the wise men and the fool mixing, so rather than just being these two separate poses, them coming together, um, and thus proposing a relation between them again. Um, so this is one where the, the fool can mimic the dying sage and vice versa, and he quotes the, um, uh, the wise man sort of dissimulating his own true nature. Um, uh, to appear as a fool out of friendship um, or in the name of friendship as we'll see and actually just a point because I think I'll trace it two or three times here as well is that that involves actually showing emotions and suppressing his true nature in that way and also the Heidegger parenthesis I think has a point about Stimmung as well and about uh, mood and emotions um, the third part then is linked to Derrida's reading of Nietzsche on Greek friendship and Christian love and poses this question as well it's both Greek and non-Greek and to whether or not that makes sense yes and no um, and again, he, here he comes to actually explicitly stress that this is around a different thinking of proximity and propriety and ownership in that relationship to friendship. Um, and that ownership is based on the disruption of the Greek understanding of friendship with the gift. And we are sort of use, I suppose, this idea of the economy and the aneconomy of the gift in Derrida. Um, but that which opens up a connection to the other and for him opens up then a connection to madness as well. So then we have the fool coming back in. Um, Just connected to that finally as well is that this is also connected to a new thinking of justice that he seems to propose as well, which is roughly, Giovanni made the point earlier as well, but there seems to be a sort of contemporary movement um, in force de loi and force of law around the right and justice type thing, which is connected to the democracy discussion we've been having. Uh, the sort of penultimate bit of that argument then is the, or the, really the final, I suppose, is the link between the impossible and its relationship to the perhaps. Um, there follows two aporias, the aporia of the event and the aporia of the decision. Um, the aporia of the decision, what you sort of brought out earlier, is that sort of the theory of subject cannot account for a decision. Um, it seems a roughly similar account and similar to the one we get in force of law. And then the aporia of the event, I think what's most notable about this, and it leads into the real final bit of the section, is that it's focused around the name. So it is exactly whether or not we should hold on to the name of this Lovens or Amos um, for the possibility of something um, to come, as this love and is what makes the figure of love possible. And then it finishes on um, Blake and for friendship's sake. And the French version of this brings it forward a little bit more, but it is in the English too, that there's this function of, a, a function of an in the name of 
So we have the establishment of a horizon, and that's what I meant by sort of one of the sort of parts of the deconstructive architecture being put in place, is that that's something we haven't really seen yet. And that maybe touches on, um, Tom, I th thought you made the great point about the way that this perhaps is also coming from the future as well, so that there's this sort of um, horizon that's installed. And I think most notably, and this brings us to the title of the whole chapter there, it is the just name, the correct name, or the, the just name, um, of friendship that actually is what's carrying that horizon. So that's the third chapter. The fourth chapter carries on with the name um, and sort of moves it in, but moves it more into a public space. Um, so the title itself is The Phantom Friend Returning in the Name of Democracy. Um, and the, the French title is L'Ami Prévenant. Um, and the, it's a really good translation, actually, because it gets the idea of like a phantom, uh, sort, of, sort of a ghost thing, and the idea of coming back, which comes with that, but it doesn't have the to come aspect that Derrida will play so much on. There's no veneer in that. There's the returning, but there's no recoming, which is really what it is then. Um, so Derrida brings, uh, brings this out. There's sort of a bit of a, a mixture of a, pro, of, a, of a few sort of detours at the beginning, um, but the one I want to focus on there is the link between the proper name and the public space. And so he connects it back to the tradition we've just seen and points out that there's this question of whether or not the proper name will be allocated to the friend and if that would be published or brought out publicly. And the reason I think that's significant and shifts us in is this is how he chooses to introduce Schmidt as well then. So Schmidt exactly um, brings forward this idea that the political requires the enemy because it requires uh, war, at least as a possibility, and there's this distinction between possibility and eventuality and how these relate to modality, and again, the perhaps that features there. He has the distinction between hostess and inimicus, however the hell that's pronounced, um, and he brings forward the idea that basically the enemy as a private in the private sphere does not make sense, that it is only possible within the public sphere, and as a result, the opposite of friendship is hostility, not enmity, so it's hostess instead of inimicus. Um, and with that, that means that, again, feelings, again, there can be no, there is no passion, there's no xenophobia, there isn't any hatred of the foreigner as such in the private sphere. But it also breaks down the friend-enemy distinction exactly because it means that I can wage war on my friend and still do so in the name of, of friendship or, or as in, in, still remains friend, friends with them in the private sphere. Then we get another section um, where he goes through um, Schmidt's use of the Greek terms polemos and stasis. Lemus is a proper war with the Bavarian status as an internal civil strife of some sort. Um, Derrida disagrees with his reading of Plato in Schmidt, um, but I think, and this is maybe the whole point of the rest of that chapter, what Derrida is trying to bring forward is the link between the familial, the biological, or the natural as a basis of some form of uh, justification for the polemos stasis distinction, um, so that there's some sort of naturalistic element to it, regardless of what way you push it. Um, and so in that sense, there is a xenophobia to it. Um, then we get Benveniste comes in. Um, he looks at the two terms for brotherhood in Greek, Adelphos and Cassignetos, um, and then uh, two other concepts for uh, uh, that as well, um, a freighter or something other. Um, and this allows him to rethink, first of all, the philia. So it allows him to, without really expanding it, to go back to, okay, well, that is another connection to Lovance. Um, but it also allows him to present the brother um, as something, again, which has a genealogy. And this is the sort of focus that goes through as well, throughout that is that the brother is something that's constructed to some degree. Um, and that centers around the name structure. Um, and what Derrida is trying to do there is make a non-natural appeal to testimony. So previously we've seen the secret in the third chapter and it seems like that follows a similar structure to testimony, which he wants to bring forward in the fourth chapter. And the Greeks are seen to be properly Greek, not just by their natural connection, but by their connection, their sort of testimony to their dead forefathers. And Derrida wants to place the emphasis on that. So the final three points that he makes are one about no decision, uh, one about fraternity, and one about hesitation about democracy. The no decision point goes back to the apparee about decision, but again, it's, there's no decision because it's determined by birth. Um, the fraternity point is in bringing out that testimony structure, which he then wants to use as a sort of gap for deconstruction. And then the third point um, about democracy um, sort of slightly split, first of all, and again, this is just expanding the deconstructive architecture, he acknowledges there's no good justification for privileging this Greek um, approach, um, but seems to offer it as more strategic. Um, he brings forward the fact that within that there's a gap between the name and the concept of democracy, which is exactly almost a precondition for deconstruction to take place, and a justification for holding on to what he calls the old name there. 
Um, and then we get the sort of first inklings of the democracy to come that features there too, which I think can be nicely linked back to the um, in the name of or for the sake of structure that we saw at the end of the third chapter. Um, and just some final general points. Um, and I think, Chris, this sort of links into the point you were making about singularity and whether or not they're um, commensurable, uh, singularity and, and calculability, is that this is the moment where we get the here and now, both in chapter three and chapter four for the first time. So chapter three begins with now as the first word. And that's a thing that Derrida will use regularly, right, is, is to sort of focus on the urgency of a decision. Um, and also that the among friends in French is, is translated as entre, uh, which is also sort of between as well. And that's there in chapter three, but then in chapter four, we have his focus on Schmidt and the Unterscheidung um, in terms of actually what makes a difference to some degree, or what is the distinguishing factor in politics. And for Schmidt, that's the enemy, but um, we can come back to that. Um, there is a comment about the genealogical privilege um, within deconstruction and a sort of a genealogical approach to genealogy, um, whatever that means. And then finally, um, if we have time, I'd like us to discuss to some degree the references to Blanchot and Nancy and the idea of community without community and so on, because I think that comes to the fore here that we've already seen. That's not bad. So to Nietzsche, I mean, I know a little bit of Schmidt was sort of new to me in this Why is it Schmidt or who is Schmidt or where is that from? You're sitting beside a Schmidt again, <laughs> <isn't it>? <laughs> <laughs> Which is often a very dangerous thing. <laughs> He's very nice and private. Schmidt is totally out of the question. 
But I think it's also, I think there is very much a French context because even two years prior to that, Derrida had a big falling out with Bourdieu in, in a French newspaper over Heidegger. And so I think there's also this sort of parallel conversation with Heidegger that's going on. And that's why even when I mentioned the parenthesis after him quoting Heidegger, there, there's these moments where he just sort of pops in for no apparent reason, right? But right, I think we're in a British context too, in that uh, Nestor Leclerc is a big thinker of, of Schmidt and Jean Delmouf, and uh, Nestor Leclerc was based at Essex, and Derrida was coming over quite often in this period to give seminars at Essex with Simon Critchley. So mm -hmm. it might have been that contact as well, mm -hmm. uh, that, that there was a, a lot of thought about Schmidt going on at Essex at the time. Yeah. And also even the French state is still at that stage not acknowledged his participation in the Holocaust, um, and Derrida sort of pushed for that at a certain point as well, privately. Um, so I think the probably an element of that too. There's, this, um, there's also another connection, um, I think, that there's this long footnote where Derrida explains the left-wing fascination for Schmidt. And um, since I work a lot with the archival materials, there's a small seminar on Walter Benjamin. And Derrida mentions the correspondence and the influence of Schmidt on Benjamin in that seminar. So it's probably there in his mind as well. And it's more or less the same period as Force of Law, Force de Loire was presented. So we get also a gambling in this discussion. Yeah. And the other exception of the all this has been published. Well there you have a kind of weird separate context which is Italian economists in the 1970s who start translating and publishing lots of Israeli conservatives as a sort of internal kind of conceptual move within, within the Italian left as well. So there, there might be also kind of Italian kind of side to, to this perception. Anything about the book? <laughs> 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 the difficult stuff? <laughs> That's my second stupid question, which is whether, whether there's really a lot of people love our friendship. Because I noticed sometimes when you were talking about it, you were also talking about you know, what makes people love us or love of the friendship. Mm. Anyone? I mean, I, I'm sort of trying, I think that's what he's trying to play with, with the idea of lovens, basically, mm. or amons, which um, works there, that like this is the condition of possibility or a structure that's essential for some form of friendship. One thing is that he um, talks about, I don't remember, was this a Nietzsche, this, that love kind of is the possessing of the other one and the friendship would be leaving the other. Um, and so both still stays in like a personal relationship, while in other thinkers like Arendt, it's like what distinguishes love and friendship is that love is always something that can only happen in the personal realm while friendship needs the world and that connection to the world and thus can become political. And he doesn't really bring that up, but I wondered if that also plays a role in this like deconstructing on the right on the one hand this idea that love is um, something that always needs to possess the other and thus um, destroys the other while friendship can have an idea of another that is not only the other person but also a connection to the world. I think this comes up a bit with the discussion of Kant in the, the penultimate chapter. Uh, when he's talking, I think, you know, because Kant, for, for, for Kant, the, the problem with love is that it tends towards fusion. Um, and, and, you know, Kant is, is the person who uses this notion of distance as being crucial to friendship. So I think we'll probably we'll come back to that a bit later when we talk about chapter 9. Yeah, and I think in those later chapters, Derrida suggests for himself love as kind of perception. Actually, think we love a certain mode of 
passion as opposed to friendship as the domain of reason. And, and, and so therefore it is a space of the political. Whereas here in Nigeria we don't have that. It, we don't kind of love and friendship do not work at the level of affectivity, if you like, or at the level of passion. And I, don't, I don't see that that thread being explored perhaps even enough. I think it's true that he probably couldn't accommodate that perspective exactly because I think or the way I was trying to break it up rather crudely is that the third chapter is trying to focus on that personal individual connection then the fourth one brings it into the public space and he can't follow Schmidt in the public private distinction on friendship because otherwise he can't break down the friendship enemy thing in the way he wants to. But I agree about the affect thing because it is a thing which pops up. I'm not sure if other people found that as well, that it's, there's emotions are particularly referenced in these two chapters, but very occasionally and in different contexts. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone picked up on that, if it was only of interest to me. It also links the whole Blanchot-Nancy dialogue as well, right? Um. I do wonder what you think about this mission. I don't want to bring it back, but whether, how, how prepared is there to follow Nietzsche on that? And we, we can see Nietzsche as a kind of a pathological figure of, of, of a love of solitude, a very similar to Wittgenstein, I'd say. Um, the question is, you know, whether that specific idiosyncrasy then is, you know, is turning into philosophical doctrine. I'm sure that I think I sense that Derrida has a suspicion towards this solitude as well. But at the same time, there is a charm. There is a, you know, there is a, there is something in charming about. But also. The, and, and to bring it back to the notions of the key I was discussing earlier from St. and so on, maybe it's better in this chapter to talk about the brother. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to read that discussion. I think the... I mean, I think that's exactly where the genealogical question comes in properly right here, is, is that. And he seems to want to push it, or certainly the way I've read it anyways. 
is that he does seem to want to try and push that onto a testimony structure so that you're either, either he reveals the fact that you're dependent on some form of natural claim or else, in fact, you're still engaged in some form of faith link or some form of credit that's offered um, to those people and, as a result, can be deconstructed to some degree. Please, I was trying to wink at you, actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I mean, in both those... So you have Bata and Nosho who meet to a certain point um, and have a very tight association that they don't entirely know everything about, but essentially Bata's book, um, is going to say that, yeah, is sort of him quoting Nosho, as he said, I met this guy Nosho, he's so great. And then, and then you have later a uh, meeting between Nancy and Nakanabat who lived together in the, you know, after 68 for about 20 years um, in a sort of um, 70s kind of commun community, but it's that commune is a community, what is it, etc. etc. And, and so and there, there is sort of proximate to, to both of those groups, but not entirely part of them. And I think he, yeah, but just biographically, the importance of the solitude would be, would be there because he is a bit worried by the fusion between that time and what show and that time is being criticized by. Not see the, you know, is that fusion sort of quasi fascistic community of kindred and so on? Um, and then he's worried with, with that and, and not see that it, it's, I don't know, it's the sort of they're living 68, they're really doing it. And it's, although he's taken as a figurehead, actually he's quite distant from it. So those, I don't know, focus on thoughts. I don't think Derek was ever involved. on privacy, the secret, uh, etc. There is a sort of standoffishness in the very theoretical framework of what Derrida thinks it is to do philosophy that doesn't seem to allow you to merge voices with someone else. I can't think of a place where Derrida writes a, a co-authored work um, in, the, in the way that Deleuze and Guattari do. I'm sure someone will come up with an exception to that now, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like something he seems almost uh, constitutively, not necessarily incapable of, but that, that, that troubles him in some way. And particularly perhaps when you see examples, not like Nancy and Kudabaf who, who maintain this connection, but people like Deleuze and Gautari seem to be capable of coming together and doing something like that and then going their separate ways. And um, that seems almost, I, I feel, I feel to Derrida, sort of, uh, almost betrayal like, that you can actually come together with someone, produce a text, and then go off. Um, it seems almost impossible to imagine, I think, for Derrida. You know, when you have the moments in the, um, the postcard where he's imagining becoming one with someone else. It's like, you know, it's, it's after he's died and he's turned into ashes and he's sprinkled in their tea and they drink him. It's like, you know, it's almost a moment of death to become part of someone else in that kind of way, to be reduced and processed and interjected as opposed to incorporated in that kind of way. So I wonder if, if, if even at level of authorship we can see this. Well, you, could, you could take that even further, so you, you, you kind of, at least rhetorically, can't be his own fact as well. So that's kind of what's going mm -hmm. on. It's, I'm glad you, sort of, you, you brought up this sort of incorporation and projection because I, there is there's something going on. I don't know if that box 
pops up in, in, in the biography, but there's some, something going on in maybe his own psychoanalysis about his own kind of um, feeling of there is something, uh, there's a, a kind of strike, something strange inside of, inside of him, and which partly kind of explains his sense of self alienation as well, which then is obviously really important in his writing. Um, well, I was just thinking, I mean, picking up on that, that um, he is an incredibly dialogic writer. So it, it is, but in a sense, I mean, and he is open to the other, but to what extent does he rework the dialogue such that, in a sense, it becomes a kind of monologue? So you, you um, which then, is kind of consistent and interior, so that, you, that there isn't a. I mean, the the alternative has been taken in, but then it's made consistent in itself, in, in a way. So, that could I mean, could it be that the dialogic quality needs to be pursued one stage further, so that he actually, I mean, when he does have. Um, conversations, he's really clear. And you want, I mean, his writing seems to, if, it almost seems like if, if he wrote in the way that he had a conversation, it wouldn't be difficult enough or it wouldn't, it wouldn't show the struggle. And he, want, he wants to show the struggle, he doesn't want to have these clear conversations. So, it, uh, um, in a way, are there two aspects to his recognising the other. One, if he's involved in a straightforward conversation, yes, he's willing to acknowledge the need to be clear, whereas in, in the writing he wants to show that, that in that being clear creates this terrible, <laughs> well, I mean, you could call it anxiety. Um, and that this anxiety has to be dwelt upon and extended and, I mean, becomes unending in, in that. You know, his, his analysis obviously wasn't. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, I don't know if that, that raises any questions because I think, I mean, I, 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 I sort of think his, the dialogic quality is essential. But then there are these two different kinds of dialogue. So we have an order of answers like the. I think that there was an answer Sorry. first down there, though. Okay. Yeah. Was it? Not so one more to participate, but I'd say, like, just in response to yours, is like, is he trying to show the struggle? Is he trying to show the struggle? Just one more. Is it like Bob's to struggle as well? Really? Well, I think we have to struggle because he, he wants to demonstrate the well, struggle. That, that, you know, that you, in a sense, yes, you can say these things really simply and clearly, but... Because that comes back to that decision again, doesn't it? Like, if you're being responsible, it's not a clear answer. It's not following, you know, some kind of program where you just get the answer. It's also not free. It's not like you've got these things and have to struggle with them. Yeah, I mean... I, I like what you were just saying, and I, I, I did sort of wonder, thinking about reading this book as a whole, whether in a sense, Derrida isn't, I mean, I think in a way he is trying to sort of have a conversation, he's trying to have a conversation with this tradition, but not precisely as a kind of, not a conversation in the sense that you and I have any conversation now as two external entities, but he's sort of trying to have a conversation with this tradition from within, and so there's a sense in which the, the sort of dialogical act of this book itself bears the structure of, of this sort of divided subjectivity that is already fissured by the other. Um, and, and this is kind of how I understand that, that relationship between uh, you know, having a conversation and, um, and this sort of tradition. I think he is trying to have a, a conversation with this tradition precisely from within it, as it were. Um, and yeah, so that's, that was what I thought. I just, uh, I, 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 Thank you. 
from the original stamps to this part of the information fiction just for a start. We don't really need to do that. And then Ces questions, je ne peux les adresser à aucun destinataire. Ces questions angoissées mais abstraites ou sont chères, je ne peux les lancer à quelque lecteur que ce soit, je ne peux les destiner que selon la supposition précipitée dans le monde. Par définition et par destination, mais pas encore arrivé, pas de domaine, pas avant. Et je pense qu'il est talking to the reader, right? Je veux dire, il est talking about the impossibility to trust them. But, I mean, the, the, the impossibility of the conversation is trying money. Okay. 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 One, one more score. Sorry. <laughs> go, Japan. Go. <laughs> you go. No. Maybe one, one possible answer is to think about Schmidt's distinction between an enemy and a foe. So an enemy that you recognize and an enemy that you don't recognize, which is how Schmidt thinks about contemporary politics. It's the idea that once America went into the Second World War, uh, it defines its kind of, it, it defines politics as a fight, as a struggle against the enemies of humanity, which means that your enemy is not human, was never recognized as such. Whereas the model of kind of aristocratic politics that you get in the Schmitz Blatton of the 20s and 30s is one in which you attempt to recover, or in the 20s attempt to recover this kind of aristocratic sort of dual with an enemy who is recognized as human as the basis for 